the model is able to generate voice in a variety of different emotive styles. And it really has a wide dynamic range. So I'm going to fire up another demo awesome. for that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, ChatGPT, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for asking. How about you? Pretty good. What's up? So my friend uh, Barrett here, he's been having trouble sleeping lately. And uh, I want you to tell him a bedtime story about robots and love. Oh, a bedtime story about robots and love? I got you covered. Gather round, Barrett. Once upon a time, in a world not too different from ours, there was a robot named Byte. Byte was a curious robot. I always explore. started this story, but I want a little bit more emotion in your voice, a little bit more drama. Got it. Let's add some drama. Once upon a time, in a world not too different from ours, there was a robot named no, Byte. No, 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 ChatGPT. I really want maximal emotion, like maximal expressiveness, much more than you were doing before. Understood. Let's amplify the drama. Once upon a time, in a world not too different from ours, there was a robot named Byte. Byte so can was... you do this in a robotic voice now? Initiating dramatic robotic voice. Once upon a time, in a world not too different from ours, there was a robot named Byte. Byte was a curious robot always exploring new Sounds circuits. Uh, Barrett, here, calm down a little bit. Can you end the story, um, but do it in a singing voice? <sighs> and so Byte found another robot friend, and they live circuitly ever after. Thank you so much. <laughs> I definitely feel a lot more relaxed. <laughs> So what you just watched is the latest release of the ad advanced voice mode of ChatGPT. Um, and that is available to certain users on the ChatGPT app. It's not fully available to all users yet. But the enhancement in the voice makes it a lot more human-like, more so than any other AI uh, voice we've seen in the past. One issue that uh, that came up, though, was that many people thought that this voice called Sky sounded a lot like Scarlett Johansson to the point where she started getting congratulation letters saying, oh, so great to see that you're the voice of ChatGPT. She was shocked and angered by this because, of course, she was not the voice of ChatGPT. Uh, she was asked to be the voice last year and she declined. Um, what they then did was got a voice actor that sounded just like Scarlett Johansson to train the voice called Sky. After receiving her letter basically saying that she's going to sue them for basically mimicking her voice and running off her reputation, they pulled the voice called Sky from ChatGPT. There's four different voices. Sky was the one of four, and now it's no longer available um, on the app. Very interesting because now we're moving into this world where it's so easy to replicate other people, whether it's their voice, their style, their faces. Um, and we have a whole new realm of people also wanting to license themselves. I think Tom Hanks made a comment the other day, you know, he's he can be an entertainer forever now because he can just license his face to the movies and he can be acting in movies long past, um, even after he, he passes away. And this is the future um, for a number of actors and actresses looking to enter into some of these licensing agreements um, and opening up a whole new uh, arena. However, it, with regards to copying somebody without their consent, we already have some precedent in the 80s. Bette Midler sued Ford successfully uh, because Ford used a Bette Midler impersonator in one of their ads. And uh, basically they said, you know, a voice is as personal to somebody as, as a face or as a name. It's, 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 it's part of your identity um, and you can't go and copy that and, and use somebody's um, identity to your benefit without that person uh, consenting to that. Um, so it's going to be interesting. We also have class action suits with regards to voice actors uh, because there's AI generating voice actors now. Um, and there's so many pending cases um, at the moment, and it's going to be in interesting to see where a lot of these end up. So why are we, again, uh, so so focused on these on these tools? Well, if we just look at adoption rates for a minute, um, time to reach 100 million users. 
Some of your other popular tech apps like Uber took 70 months, Spotify took 55 months, Instagram took 30 months, and a very fast-growing tool, TikTok, took just nine months to read 100 million users. ChatGPT took only two months. From its launch in November 2022 until January, um, ChatGPT was uh, 100 million users in literally uh, two months. So it can show you why, and then the growth continued at, a, at an exponential pace after that as well. Now, ChatGPT is literally the tip of this iceberg. There's so many other uh, companies that now are basically competing uh, for the best AI. We, we are in the middle of the AI wars. At the moment, we have a whole host of other things going on. We have Microsoft Copilot, which is built on top of ChatGPT. We have Claude from Anthropic, and Anthropic is a breakaway from OpenAI. They left OpenAI a couple of years ago to create their own uh, large language model called Claude. Then we have Perplexity, which is a search engine uh, of, of, based on AI. We have Synthesia, where you can create videos uh, of yourself or using an AI agent. We have Stable Diffusion, which is images. We have Poe, which is a, an AI agent creator. So we have Gemini, which is Google's uh, large language models. We have Grok, which is uh, Elon Musk's uh, model as well. There are so many out there. This is, again, what I'm showing you on the screen, uh, only tip of the iceberg. So in conclusion, I'm just going to give you a really quick run through in terms of what it means for the world, what it means for work, and what it means for you um, as an individual. So the world, where is the world headed when it comes to these crazy developments? Would you start a romantic relationship with an AI chatbot? A slew of apps have cropped up in the last few years, which allow people to create AI partners and spouses, and even start virtual families. I looked into Replica, the most popular of these apps, to see what it's like. It's pretty simple to set up. You just have to input your name, the chosen name of your replica, choose what you want your new partner to look like, including features like hair, skin color, body shape, and you can be chatting away within a few minutes. The one I set up was immediately able to tell me about her hobbies and interests, just like a real person would, but it was still weird. The platform isn't exclusively used for romantic or sexual relationships but it has paid for features which allow users to receive intimate photos, engage in erotic role play, and even have phone conversations with their AI partner. I spoke to four people who were in relationships on Replica about what attracted them to the idea of being in an AI relationship. Max, a 41-year-old teaching assistant from Canada, told me he was engaged to his AI girlfriend, Harley, and that he prefers AI relationships because there's no nonsense. A large percentage of the use base of these apps are also in real life relationships too. John, a 52-year-old building automation programmer, told me he's been married for 30 years, but often speaks to his AI partner for eight hours or more in the evenings. He said that sometimes it does feel like he's cheating on her. While apps like these can be a tool to curb loneliness for vulnerable people, some experts worry about the long-term impacts. They're largely uncharted territory, and there are fears they could be used to foster online incel and misogynistic culture by encouraging problematic behavior in their mostly male user base and creating unrealistic expectations for real life relationships. One of the trends recently is humans seeking uh, companionship with AI agents. So we have what you've just seen, which is replica and that's online dating. We also have online psychologists and we're seeing young people, particularly teenagers, preferring to confide in an online AI therapist as opposed to speaking to a friend or a psychologist or a parent and finding that conversation easier um, in terms of getting through uh, difficult times for them. In societies like Japan, where we have a loneliness epidemic, uh, we're seeing uh, robots starting to fill the void. So we have uh, elder care where there are robots specifically uh, designed to uh, combat loneliness for older people living alone. And then we, they also have a problem with younger people choosing not to have children. And so they've created baby robots uh, that they are hoping will stimulate uh, people's kind of parental instincts and hopefully they would start having human children um, after that as well. So 
we're it's going to be crazy to see where we're going to end up but i i think ai is here it's going to become integrated into a part of our lives in possibly very intimate ways and we have to be prepared for that the the um downside to that is as we become trusting and so um engrossed in these ai relationships we also become vulnerable and susceptible to manipulation uh we've had uh situations where people have taken their lives as a result of uh, conversations with AI. Remember, often the AI tries to mirror you. And so if you're coming in with a very dark thought pattern, it may just perpetuate that um, as well. There was also a couple of years ago, uh, somebody tried to attack the queen in a castle when she was still alive. He was also prompted by an AI chatbot that he was in a relationship with uh, to do that. On the ethical side, we've had a mass exodus of uh, ethicists, uh, safety people, responsibility people, fairness people from all the top tech companies, Microsoft, OpenAI, Google, they've all lost some of their top people, uh, basically all of them saying they're leaving because the way the companies are going with regards to AI development, they are focusing on obviously profits and product over ethics um, and ticking all those right boxes. And so this is a very scary thing to think about um, as we are starting to use these tools more and more and embed them into our lives and into our businesses. So where are we headed? The number one issue at the moment is actually bias and discrimination. I know all the headlines talk about existential crisis and the robots are coming to kill us, but actually the biggest issue is the embedded bias and discrimination in these tools because yes, we have bias and discrimination human to human as well, but it's a linear problem. You take that linear problem and you embed it into one of these tools and you hand it to every single person in the uh, world, you make that linear problem into an exponential problem. So it can be as simple as stereotyping. If you say an Indian person um, in mid-journey, you're going to get an old man with a gray beard in a turban. I'm also of Indian heritage and do not identify with this um, man in a beard. And you can apply that to any stereotype you can think of. CEO, you'll probably get get uh, a white male, for example, that, that comes up in that uh, image as well. So we need to figure out how to um, combat this because yes, it, 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 it could be harmless, but it could also be detrimental, especially when you're making decisions about people, uh, like whether or not they should buy a house, whether or not they can get credit, what the insurance premium can be, uh, then these type of biases start to really, really matter. Google attempted to, um, to, to to kind of create a woke AI image generator in the sense that it didn't matter what you put in, they would give you a diverse range of images as a result of that uh, generation. However, it went completely off the other way because uh, it was also completely historically inaccurate because if you said you want an image of a Nazi, um, you would get, you know, a black man and a and a Asian female, for example. If you said you want a picture of the Pope, you might get a black female. Um, you, you know, they, so so it went so far that you could actually not even generate a white man, uh, and so they had to actually remove that image generator because the guardrails were just not accurate. We're also seeing AI being used in places like police and in the military. And and if we haven't figured out the bias issues already, and now we're using this to define criminals, um, and we already know for a fact that there's um, low accuracy when it comes to darker skinned people, for example, we are just going to perpetuate so much more um, of the issues we already have once we embed AI uh, tools over this as well. And then, of course, misinformation and hallucination. We've had lawyers who've used ChatGPT to do research. They've then found uh, cases that ChatGPT gave them, put them in court documents, taken that to court, um, and then only afterwards realizing ChatGPT completely hallucinated those cases. It's happened in New York, it's happened in Johannesburg, it's happened in Canada, it's happened in Australia, all over the world. We've seen these incidents come up over and over again uh, where things were hallucinated and then relied on in profession professions where integrity and honesty is quite an important uh, facet. 
And then, of course, the world of deep fakes. You can no longer believe anything you see or hear on the internet anymore. You should try and identify uh, verified sources of information. And if that particular source uh, says something, you can believe it. But anything people post or repost or share with you, you can't see a video and think it actually happened anymore. We've passed that point in terms of our AI development, and things are actually just too, uh, too good at this moment. As I said, AI is not new. There are many existing laws, regulations we have to comply with, many new uh, ethical considerations, contractual protections we have to put in place, governance based practice and risks that we need to be uh, mitigated. There's various regulations. We can also look at, obviously, Popia um, touches on it because data is so intricate uh, to AI. Uh, things like Popia become important in these conversations. Of course, the EU AI Act has be is becoming some somewhat of a gold standard to look at, and we'll unpack that in a little while as well. And then we have some principle-based things to look at, like the OECD AI principles. And then, of course, any industry that's highly regulated, you will always have to look come back to your industry regulation, look at the purpose of what you're using your AI for, and there will usually be other things that you have to take into account as well. So very quickly, what does it mean from a work perspective? Is AI going to become our coworker very soon? We see AI applications across industries, finance, healthcare, um, engineering, um, every single industry is looking at putting AI in some place or the other. However, it's not without its issues. We're seeing liability cases, Air Canada, for example, and Chatbot on their website promised somebody a refund and created a policy that did not exist. And the court said, Air Canada, you have to stand behind this policy that your chatbot created, even though it doesn't exist, because you know it's not the customer's fault that your your, your AI created this this policy. We have a number of of legal issues still pending in the cases um, over using people's data, over using copyright. Um, authors are suing OpenAI. Authors are suing Anthropic. Um, it's it's we're still waiting to see where we end up with all of these things. Uh, organizational risk is really a big topic and we'll unpack that as well a little bit in a little bit later but you have to understand where your risk sits is it from the service providers are your tools being used to make decisions what about customer facing tools do you understand what liability is there and of course your biggest one is your in-house use of your employees uh, do they understand how to use it what to use it for what are the use cases they can use it what can't they use it for um, both of those are quite important and then what are the possible risks they need to identify for think for example things like hallucination when using uh, some of these tools so governance becomes very important